Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Climate Solutions for Cumbria Landscapes session today, this time focusing on rivers. Um, I'm Tim Gale. I'm the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership Manager. And as Nigel said, I do my best to guide us through this, uh, this session uh, this morning. Um, this is uh, one of uh, four, um, actually five, I think, Nigel, isn't it now, um, events that um, we're putting on as part of the um, Zero Carbon Cumbria uh, training and land use events of Climate Solutions for Cumbria Landscape. So far, we've had two great sessions on uh, trees and on peatlands, two further events planned. Um, so we're, we're um, planning two further events on exploring hedgerows on the 14th of March um, and coasts on the 28th of April. Um, but back to today, we, we, we know that um, effective responses to the climate challenge will need um, real consideration, real multi-partner uh, uh, responses, multi-dimensional responses to that challenge that focuses on uh, mitigation, uh, carbon emissions reduction and sequestration, um, uh, as well as um, adaptation, recognising that climate change is already happening, already having real effects on the county. And, you know, we're a county, aren't we, that, that are very familiar with, with climate change impacts, including uh, extreme weather events. Um, so the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership is, is working towards uh, an ambitious net zero target for the county of 2037. And um, we know that um, that trajectory and pathway to that date will be uh, partially met and significantly met um, through land use change and increasing carbon storage in our, in our landscapes. Um, so these sessions on Cumbria landscapes are really important and I think particularly uh, particularly so um, in the support of one of our thematic sector groups working on uh, farming, the future of farming uh, and land use change. And, and that group is going to be focusing on these issues uh, at a county scale uh, and, and seeking to build uh, seeking to build that cross um, organizational set of projects and collaboration between the, the key partners and players that uh, that are working in our Cumbrian landscapes. Um, so today we're gonna to hear about some of the, the co-benefits uh, of climate and nature emergency responses, um, including actions by um, charities and communities uh, in areas such as um, nature recovery, um, flood management, uh, water quality improvements, um, as well as uh, the operation at uh, the opportunities um, from, uh, from power generation. So I think that's enough for a brief introduction to the session from me. Uh, we've got some really um, great speakers and presentations lined up. So um, without further ado, we'll, we'll move on to those. Uh, and the first uh, first speaker we have uh, from uh, Eden Rivers Trust um, is Anna and Vicky. Um, so Anna and Vicky, over to you. Can you see that all okay? Yes, thanks, Anna. That's yeah. okay for me. Thank you, Tim. Um, hi, my name is Anna Holiday. I'm here from the Eden Rivers Trust, uh, and I'm here with Vicky Salas from West Cumbria Rivers Trust. Um, hi. We're here to <laughs> go on, Vicky. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, and we're here to speak to you today about uh, who we are, what we do, uh, and how you can get involved. Uh, so we are ind independent environmental charities. Uh, you can see our ranges from the maps on the screen. Um, Eden Rivers Trust span from um, the north of Carlisle down to Kirby Stephen um, and West Cumbria Rivers, Rivers Trust on the left there. Um, so Eden Rivers Trust covers the entire Eden catchment, um, whereas West Cumbria Rivers Trust covers multiple river catchments with the largest being the Derwent. Uh, we're part of a national network of Rivers Trust and we are committed to improving Cumbria rivers and lakes for people and wildlife. We rely on funding and grants. Within uh, Cumbria, there's also the South Cumbria Rivers Trust and the Loon Rivers Trust. So what is it that we do? Um, well, we carry out physical improvements to rivers and their catchments. 
we undertake species specific conservation work. Uh, we work with and advise landowners, tenants and river users. And we teach people about our special wildlife and encourage people to enjoy our rivers. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, we're just going to do a bit of uh, ping pong with the uh, uh, presentation here. Um, so, yeah, I've just got sort of set the scene really in terms of um, future climate and, and rivers in particular. So um, we know that the impacts of the changing climate will be felt, it will be felt. Um, within our rivers and water resources. Um, both in terms of flooding and droughts, which will increase in frequency um, as our weather patterns change. Um, and just to note there, I've put on some of the um, peak flow um, statistics uh, produced by uh, CEH. Um, they produce these for, for all the different management catchments, catchments that the EA classify. So this is the Derwent statistics, um, and you can see some quite... Um, Concerning um, projections for a peak river flow um, going forwards in terms of um, yeah, in terms of um, increased flood risk um, within the River Derwent catchments. Um, those are um, slightly worse, in fact, for the for the Eden. Um, I think the upper scenario for 2080s for the Eden is something like 93% um, increase in peak flow. Um, so yeah, that's just a sort of backdrop of uh, what we um, what we could potentially face. Um, um, and also, water temperatures is an issue in terms of some of our wildlife. Salmon and trout start to become stressed at about twenty degrees, um, and water temperatures start to become lethal um, at twenty four. When it reaches something like thirty, then it's um, you know fairly sort of instant. Um, yeah, in terms of um, impact on salmon and trout. I could just move on to the next slide, Anna. Um, so what we're sort of working towards is uh, a resilient river, but that means a resilient catchment in reality. Um, so we take a catchment based approach to improving water courses. Um, we know there's lots of issues in Cumbria, many of our watercourses have been modified, have been straightened, have been moved, um, you know, away from the low point of the floodplain to the side of floodplains quite often. Um, structures have been added in the past uh, to facilitate, um, you know, mills and things like that in, in the past. Um, so this means that many of our watercourses aren't particularly resilient to the changing climate. They, um, you know, are already seeing impacts that dry up in the summer. Um, and in you know winter, uh, the impacts of um, flooding and high flows, um, they can transport water and sediments too quickly downstream. Um, yeah, so we're we're working towards um, making rivers a bit more resilient. Um, many of the interventions that we do have um, multiple benefits. Um, you know, it's just discussed about you know the, a whole range of series about hedgerows and tree planting and the other things, but all that imp you know impacts on the rivers at the end of the day. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, riparian tree planting um, something we work on a lot. You know, it keeps rivers cool in terms of water temperatures, biodiversity, slow the flow, carbon storage, obviously lots of impacts, um, and wetlands again. Um, you know. The, the, um, Reduce the impacts of flooding, droughts, water quality, um, as well improvements, biodiversity, carbon storage, uh, you know, a whole range of multiple <coughs> benefits that many of the interventions have. So we could just move on, Anna. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some of the work we've been doing in the Glenda Mackin catchment. Um, this is a catchment upstream of Keswick, um, just one of the areas that we're working in as a trust. Um, it's a, a quite large catchment, 142 kilometres squared, um, and there's a, a picture of the, the catchment there, upstream of Keswick includes Thirlmere, uh, but the area we focus on is mainly downstream of, of Thirlmere. Um, United Utilities own a lot of the land and are also doing a lot of work upstream of Thirlmere. Um, <clears throat> the issues, um, not unlike issues elsewhere within Cumbria, flooding uh, within Keswick, um, the triple SI, the triple SI SAC river is in unfavorable condition. Um, there's a general lack of biodiversity, yeah. both in river and the wider catchment too. Um, so the project we're looking at is focusing on um, nature-based solutions um, 
and improving water quality and quantity in the environment. Carbon sequestration is a, another sort of side benefit really from what we're doing and habitat creation and biodiversity. Um, so what we've done to date, um, we've been working on this project since 2019. Um, we've worked with um, over 40 farmers and landowners within the catchment um, um, to undertake a lot of um, delivery of interventions. Um, when, um, a lot of the focus has been on natural flood management to date. Um, we had funding from a water environment grant and uh, the DEFRA NFM programme. Um, so we've under, also undertaken through that um, monitoring of individual NFM features um, to see how they're performing. Um, we've undertaken quite a lot of work. There's a whole list of things we've done there. I won't run through them all one by one. Um, let me see this quite large scale work we've done um, and some images at the bottom. Um, we've done things like working with farmers to improve their soils, um, quite a few leaky dams, um, it's an area where I've undertaken quite a lot of wetland uh, sort of pond work um, which holds water in the landscape permanently but also temporarily holds quite a lot of water back during storm events. Uh, we've done river restoration work, riparian fencing, tree planting, the mill works. Um, but there's a willingness within this catchment to sort of scale up um, um, and that's where um, I'll come on to in a minute. So we can move on to the next slide. Anna. Um, it's one of the examples of one of the ponds and wetlands we've done um, is uh, this water storage area in the Nadal Valley. Um, it's permanent wetland habitat um, that, that stores um, open sorry I'm just getting <laughs> distracted by the questions come on to those in a minute <laughs> um that um stores water permanently um as it you know always has a sort of permanent water level but also um has a sort of buns and an outlet and it's designed to store water in flood conditions too um and then to drain down um fairly rapidly um after that so this stores about 4,000 cubic meters in flood conditions um but it's also a great habitat um there move on to the next one uh, we've done lots of other things uh, we've done things like um, upsizing culverts um, you can see on the picture there on the left um, that culvert there presented quite a significant issue both to fish passage and also the sort of natural geomorphology of the river all the gravels kept blocking up upstream um, uh, this river it wasn't um, allowing the uh, gravels to move downstream as as it sh as they should um, so downstream was sort of gravel starved um, so we've increased the size of that culvert um, so just to allow more uh, natural processes obviously still there's still a culvert there but obviously there's a road access so uh, that was still required um, it's much bigger now <clears throat> um, we've done things like riparian tree planting um, and all sorts of things like these swales in the catchment um, behind sort of embanked hedgerows which store surface water runoff temporarily in flood conditions to on to the next one Anna. um we've been working on floodplain um uh, sort of increasing the uh, the um oh just can't get my words out <clears throat> Uh, increasing the roughness of floodplains. So um, this is the Glendamackin floodplain, um, A66 on the, the right of the picture there as you come down towards Keswick. Um, the river comes out of here anyway in a, in a flood event um, and comes out onto the floodplain. So we're trying to increase um, the resilience really. So it means that the water um, slows flow, um, flows slower across the floodplain. Um, and just holds onto the floodplain a little bit longer, um, reducing the um, the flood peak downstream. So we've put some buns across the floodplain there, which you can probably just about make it out from the aerial picture. Um, that helps just store a bit more water on that floodplain during a flood event. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this was one that hasn't got a lot of um, sort of environmental benefits per se in terms of the bund itself, but it's you know helping. Um, just reduce the speed that that water travels across the floodplain. Um, other things we've done on this same floodplain, if we could just move on to the next slide, Anna, things like um, we've um, put in more kested hedgerows across the floodplain, hedgerows without kests too, really to just, you know, 
reduce the speed at which that water flows across the floodplain. Um, and also the environmental benefits, obviously, of uh, new hedgerow planting there too. Um, so looking forward, we're looking to scale up um, the work that we've been doing, as I mentioned. Um, so we've currently got a grant um, from the DEFRA's NERF programme, Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund. Um, and we're looking at upscaling the delivery of nature-based solutions in this catchment for all those benefits uh, that I touched upon. Um, it's a slightly different way of funding um, with um, merging public and private um, finance. Um, so we're looking at significantly upscaling. It's a very ambitious project of around £12 million pounds, um, to reduce um, flood peak, uh, the flood peak in Keswick. Uh, we've been working on the modelling for that. Uh, we've got a modelling group working with the EA and Lancaster University, uh, JBA, etc. Um, so our current modelling is showing that um, with that scale of delivery in the catchment um, and for all those multiple benefits, we could um, also reduce the flood peak in Keswick in the present day climate scenario by about 13%. But obviously, as we go through that climate trajectory, um, by the time we reach the 2050s on the median climate scenario, it will be um, reducing that flood peak by about 7%. Um, um, so still very early days, um, still um, in lots of discussions with potential buyers and working with a farmer group um, too around um, um, potential interventions going forwards. Um, but yeah, it's um, our ambition to scale that one up. So um, Anna's just going to talk about uh, one of her, the Eden Rivers Trust case studies now on Bessie Gill. Thanks, Vicky. Um, Yes, so um, Bessie Gill was one of our projects um, completed in 2019 uh, on the Lowther Estate south of Penrith. Uh, so we aim to restore natural river processes and improve habitat. Uh, we did this by um, improving over one kilometre of river habitat through stage zero restoration. Uh, 20 in improving and reconnecting 23 hectares of floodplain habitat and creating a 1.6 hectare um, NFM feature, natural flood management. Um, so the original problems with the habitat um, were that the channel was narrow, um, straightened, featureless and in a, grazed, a sheep grazed landscape. Uh, there were no fish and little other wildlife um, and very little capacity for natural flood management. Uh, the map um, on the right shows um, the canal that we, um, that I'll go on to talk about in a second, is on the southern, uh, in the southern square in red. And the um, NFM pond feature is on the northern area. So first I'll talk about the um, river habitat. Um, uh, the restoration of the river was achieved through filling in existing river channel where it entered a culvert under the M6 and we created a new channel uh, to allow the river to spill into its natural floodplain. Uh, this is known as stage zero restoration and that's where um, the river is restored to as close as possible to its original state. This is one of the first of its kind in the UK. Uh, the low gradient landscape meant that it was an ideal um, area for, for floodplain restoration and it can hold water in um, both high and low, um, low flow um, water flows. Uh, so now um, this area creates a bit of a wildlife oasis um, even in our summers that are becoming um, more and more um, common with drought. As for the um, pond that we created, uh, it stores water, which increases the time it takes for the water to reach uh, our water courses, and that helps reduce flooding downstream. Wetlands uh, help 
make habitat more resilient to the effects of climate change uh, by retaining water, both in um, winter and summer. The project is now being monitored by both Eden Rivers Trust and University of Lancaster for ecological and NFM benefits. Uh, the, the project was part of uh, Cumbria River Restoration Strategy uh, and was in collaboration with the Environment Agency, Seabec uh, Eco Engineering and the landowner. So how can you get involved? Uh, both West Cumbria Rivers Trust and Eden Rivers Trust have their own volunteer programs. Um, they do uh, fantastic work with um, involving river conservation tasks. So uh, that's involving riparian tree planting, um, removal of invasives, um, coppicing, uh, a full, full uh, spread of activities. If you want to support us, uh, you can follow us on social media, uh, be an advocate for resilient um, river catchment and sign up to our newsletter. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you, Vicky, as well. I think um, it's really great to see such um, you know, so many practical examples of where you've, you've made those interventions. And I think you know, it really stands out uh, that there's so many different options for um, tackling this issue so thank you for for sharing that up and, and really good to see that you've got that you know that level of ambition your plans around the, the DEFRA funding as well so look forward to keeping uh, in touch with you on that thanks very much indeed uh, we're going to move on uh, quickly I'll do, a, do our best to keep to to the schedule I'm going to hand over now to to Becky Becky Powell from the National Trust so welcome Becky hello hopefully you can hear me okay yeah, I can hear you fine. Wonderful. Um, I'm just going to share my screen okay. um, and pop some slides up. So um, hopefully uh, you can see that. If I can get the actual presentation to run. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk you through um, the work that we've done as part of the Riverlands project at Goldrill Beck. So uh, the Riverlands project is a project that is a partnership between National Trust and the Environment Agency operating across the Lake District. And over the past five years, we've done a number of river restoration projects, peat restoration, wet woodland restoration and access projects as well. Um, but I'm going to run through Goldrill Beck in a bit of detail with you today because we've done a, a lot of modelling and we're starting to get some really interesting outputs in terms of the impact that these projects can have for our resilience going forwards. So Goldrill Beck is uh, just downstream of Brothers Water in Hartsop, upstream of Patterdale and Glen Riddy. Um, the Beck itself uh, previously ran in an exceptionally straight and canalised course directly adjacent to the A592, which was the only what is the only access road <coughs> through that valley. Um, it was severely embanked, uh, so we had a, a ranging from a 1 to a 1.8 metre embankment running along the course of that river, separating the river totally from the floodplain, um, meaning that the only time it accessed the, that floodplain was in really extreme flood events. So it was an exceptionally efficient conduit of water and sediment uh, to downstream communities and, and other areas which were uh, significantly more at risk. Um, this, this project has sort of been on the cards for the National Trust for about 20 years, our, our range of jumping has done an exceptional job of, of <clears throat> really uh, flying the flag for river restoration and, and keeping the possibility in, in the minds of people living within these communities. But really Storm Desmond provided the catalyst for us to really start thinking a bit more seriously about this work. So in Storm Desmond, um, there were severe breaches of, of the embankments, which deposited a lot of uh, sediment across fields. And also, um, I'm sure people remember, through Glen Ridding, through Patterdale, and caused an awful lot of disruption. The A592 was closed upstream of where we've done this project because another beck came out and flooded it there. But perhaps one of the more concerning aspects was Goldrill Beck 
began to severely undercut the A592. And anyone who remembers uh, Storm Desmond will remember the Lake District being cut in half at Dunmel Rays um, when the road washed out there. And there was a very, very significant risk that this was going to happen on the A592 um, between Patterdale and Kirkston Pass. So <clears throat> we got to work uh, designing a project and you can see on the screen. Can you see? I'm just hoping that you can see that image on the right or if the Zoom calls obscuring it. No, it looks fine, Becky. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, so you can see that that's a visualisation of what we thought we might get when we undertook this project. So we were going to move the back away from its canalised course back into the lowest part of the floodplain, um, connecting the river again once more with the floodplain, increasing the habitats that are, are within it. So I should also mention that this river itself is a triple SI SAC, part of the River Eden designation, and it was in unfavourable condition for a number of reasons, including the physical modifications present along this reach. So we got to work and we were meant to start this in 2020, but uh, a, a certain uh, global pandemic halted us in our tracks and we eventually got the project done in 2021. So you can see on this image uh, uh, before and after of the river once it was completed. And I'm gonna talk you through a little bit more detail about some of the features that we, we have added in. Um, but I'll just give you an overview of what we have achieved there. So we worked on a total of 1.6 kilometers of gold rule back, and that included meandering uh, nearly 900 meters of the original channel and removing 700 meters of embankment. The original river length on the reach we worked on, on the reach we remeandered, was 889 metres. The new river length is 2.5 kilometres. So the increased capacity for water throwing down, flowing down these new channels has, has significantly increased. The project itself uh, created uh, 28,000 metres squared of functional wetland, floodplain wetland habitat, as well as 24,000 metres squared of wet woodland habitat. Um, so in terms of both the flood resilience and the habitat diversity and niches that have been created, the gains have been significant. <clears throat> um, so this is just a bit of detail about the things that, that we did, and I'm going to skip through these quite quickly in an in a effort to keep to time. So you can just see on the, the picture on the left, that is the diversion point. We have to always you know, provide a bit of protection on those areas. But downstream of that area, the river is um, allowed to totally do what it wants within that field parcel. Uh, it can move, it can jump into different channels, it can jump into previous ditches. We're happy for that to be really dynamic. Uh, we seeded a number of gravel bar features. Um, the, the river upstream is has previously been quite managed, so we wanted to seed these, these gravel bars so that um, any depleted sediment supply that might be coming in was accounted for. Um, feel free to ask me a question on that if you want more detail at the end of, of the presentations. <clears throat> Here we've got one of the main channels uh, a month before connection and after the connection. You can see just how quickly these sites can recover. Once we've done the work, the gravel start to deposit really nicely. You get these nice sidebars, some bankside vegetation coming back in that location as well and nice diversity in the actual in-channel habitat as well. So pools and riffles for it forming. And Vicky was talking about um, temperature, water temperature requirements for our freshwater species. And these pools are quite often missing on our modified river systems. So they're really important for habitat niches to, to keep areas of water cooler as we move forward in the ever uncertain world of climate change. We put in an osprey platform, that's always nice. We've not got one yet, but hopefully we'll have one uh, pretty soon. Uh, you can see in the right-hand side of the image uh, where we remove the embankment to reconnect the river with the floodplain there um, and slow the flow of water through across that floodplain, allowing the access into that floodplain again where previously it wasn't. Um, just some photos of the channels merging back together after they split across the floodplain going into the wet woodland, which was 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 always a bit wet, but we've made it an awful lot wetter and we're starting to see it absolutely flourish since we've we've completed the work, both in terms of its terrestrial ecology, but also the birds that are using the site as well. 
Um, and there's a picture of the wet woodland, bit muddy during the work, hard to hard to do this sort of thing without making a, a little bit of a mess during construction, but recovering really, really nicely pretty soon after we'd done the work and the the evidence of the way the flows interacted through that wet woodland environment um, and the new channels it started to, to cut is really interesting and, and starting to give us some really good data on just how much wet woodland can offer us in terms of slowing the flow. So there's a picture of the site once it was completed after a bit of rain. Alongside the main channel works, we also did a number of deculvertings, some scrape creations, and just really returned this uh, this bottom valley land into a totally functional habitat. Um, I will mention that previously this uh, land was grazed by a cattle herd. It is still grazed by that same cattle herd. So one of the things we really wanted to demonstrate was that you can really achieve great things with river restoration without impacting uh, the farm business if you consider it all carefully uh, in the design phase. We've got a significant amount of monitoring on the site. So we fly it regularly with drones uh, with a really high resolution uh, LIDAR on them, which captures sediment sizes across the site and has allowed us to determine how much sediment the site has stored since we did the project. So if we think about that old canalised river channel previously shooting sediment straight downstream to the next weak point uh, in embankments, um, which tends to be around infrastructure, um, we're now storing a lot of this uh, material on site. When I'm talking about sediment, I'm talking about from tiny gravels up through to your 20, 30 centimetre um, boulder size of, of material. Um, this is a bit out of date, this slide. So the latest flight we've had shows that we've stored nearly 1,800 metres cubed of sediment um, on this site since the completion of the project. And this is all material that hasn't ended up in Patterdale or Glenridding, but is being worked across this site. Some of it will never find its way out of it. Some of it will, but it's providing a much more natural sediment transportation regime in that reach of the river. <clears throat> we also have monitoring stations that are picking up uh, flow levels at the top and the bottom of the restoration reach. So we know that in previous events before we did the restoration, the flood peaks at the top and the bottom of this reach were absolutely simultaneous. They occurred at exactly the same time. You can see that from that top graph. Um, since we've done the work, we know that there's now a two to three hour lag between the up and the downstream flood peaks um, across that reach. And we can also see that the upstream um, peak is ever so slightly higher. Now we can't fix the world with these projects, but every little helps when we're talking about, you know, the severe flooding that we've seen across the Lake District in past decades. So we know that the wet woodland is doing its job in retaining um, some of that water, that the pools and the ponds are doing their job in retaining some of that water, but also that the access of the river to that floodplain is definitely doing its job in terms of slowing the speed of the flood downstream. Um, some nice pictures really of what it looks like now it's done. Um, we've got woody debris that's entered the site in floods and it's quite happily camped out there and providing again really important habitat niches. Um, you can see really on the top right hand picture the extent of the sediment and gravel storage across that site. Uh, the bottom left hand picture is showing the wet woodland um, and all of those sort of small side channels that are opening up. And then we've got the embankment removal down on the bottom left. Um, we've done some tree planting on this site, but it's still an active farmed parcel. So it's we, we don't have aspirations to plant it up with trees. We have just planted 16 black poplar, which are um, critically endangered in this country there are there are native poplar species rather than they're quite bushy rather than the tall american poplar that we're used to seeing um so the hope is that we can grow on a, a genetically diverse habit uh, population of black poplar across two of the riverland sites which we've been working on and and start to spread that a little bit more across some of our land um so that is gold roll back and i will leave it there hopefully i've not run too far over my time or I've been just about right but um thank you very much for listening thanks so much Becky um that's another really positive um demonstration I think of what's possible and, and fantastic images as well uh, to demonstrate that and it's good to see those outcomes from from all that hard work so thank you very much uh, for 
for sharing that that with us. Um, we're going to move on now to to John to John Mullen um, from the National Trust is going to talk to us about yeah Lake District Hydro and Healthy Rivers. So over to you, John. Thanks, Tim. Let me just get the presentation up. Okay. Is that on the screen? That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks for inviting me along. I was going to talk about um, hydros and why they're a good thing, but I think everyone on this call probably agrees with that anyway. So just to tell, just to talk about what the what the National Trust has done. Um, what. Um, what we found and what the link is really to, to healthy rivers going forward and how that can that can help what we're doing in the future. So just a quick um, summary of uh, the high head hydro is what we're doing. So we're not putting Archimedes screws in rivers. We're taking rivers high up in the mountains. Um, so we've been working in the Lake District and Areri Snowdonia um, where we take a part some of the water out of the rivers, take it down a pipe, penstock, which is normally buried um, into a powerhouse through the turbine and, and generate. Um, and mainly this has gone straight to the grid just because these, these sites are very, very remote and there's no kind of real nearby use. Um, these are the 10 schemes that we've done over the last eight years um we've done 11 which i'll come on to the, the top left is stickle gill where we actually use some of the power which goes into the stickle barn pub um so if you're ever in there having a drink it's chilled if it's raining it's chilled by the uh, by the the river next door um so it as you can see there's lots there's lots of different landscapes lots of different geology that we note lots of different ecology in the rivers and the catchments um, and the catchment geography themselves all change. So, it's, so we try to, A, we try to hide what we're doing. Um, B, we try to use local stone, local vernacular. Um, so it, it, we judge it as success if you've walked past our schemes without seeing them. We're very modest like that. Um, so just moving on. The 11th scheme is um, Watendleth. So you, some of you may know Watenleth, which is a hanging valley above Borrowdale. Uh, the water comes down from Watenleth Tarn to Derwent Water. Um, it's very difficult to get to access a, a dead end uh, road uh, from nearby uh, Keswick. So we've um, there was an existing scheme at Watenleth, and um, we've replaced. Well, we've upgraded and replaced that scheme. This is this is the the penstock, the pipe trench. The the peach coloured pipe is actually a, a sewage pipe we found as we were excavating. So the larger pipe, you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, so this is this is in construction, which is twenty late twenty one, and this is it now. So um, as we say, we this is looking back from that digger towards the the screen. So you can see the screen below the barn there, which is capturing the water, which then goes into the pipe. So the screen actually keeps out stone and rock uh, and, and uh, vegetation from going into the turbine. And it should uh, clear, clean itself. So when the river rises up, when we're able, we only take water when the river's at a certain level. So water will always flow before we, we're actually generating. Um, and this is where, I'm going to come on to kind of why we need healthy rivers. So to maximize our generation, we need uh, these rivers to be clean and not to have um, not to have our screens blocked. And also what we get, we find uh, peat comes down into the water, lines the pipe and reduces the, the diameter of our pipes. So it, we, we get less efficient hydros. So we need to keep that peat up in, up in the catchments. So there's a close-up of the screen. Um, this on, on the upper upstream side of the screen, that is a mixture of vegetation and sphagnum moss. 
So it's moss, which, you know, we'd like to keep up in the bogs above the tarn. Um, the, the, the string of vegetation you see has come from the tarn. So, we'd, you know, we thought, our thoughts are, is, you know, is that a, a nutrient problem within the tarn itself, which is coming down the river? And we know that Derwent water has, uh, you know, blue-green algae issues, as do other other um, lakes and waters in 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 the Lake District. So this creates a problem. We have to uh, daily now go up and clean that screen, and it it, it does actually impact on performance. We'll get ten percent by cleaning that, giving it a brush. We'll get ten percent more uh, generation from from the scheme. But it's obviously it's it's uh, it's using a, someone who could be doing something else. It's 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 a maintenance issue. It's um, it's something that we if, if we could have a healthier river, then we we would uh, we we would do without that, and then cr and create more green electricity. So the solution is at the top of the catchment, and um, we we like to call this our battery. So rather than producing energy and putting it into a battery. This is our battery of potential energy. So we've got, um, this is Armboth Fell above above Watendleth. And we can create more of this where we have slower released water coming down, which is filtered um, from uh, deeper sphagnum moss um, and vegetation. That's coming down cleaner. We know that this work's happening. So Becky and her team are, are working on this at the moment. So the two, the Riverland scheme and the hydro works do are working in in parallel for, um, for different aims, but overall, you know, a great solution. So, if we can clean trap and clean the water, we we can store that. So when we have these longer periods of drought where the hydros are off, this water can be can be still be trickling down. So we're generating longer. So this is our this is our solution to for cleaning water, but also generating more. And uh, that's it, Tim. Thank you, John. Um, that's that's great. I think um, Nigel may have um, put in the chat. There's something I noted down as well about the the links between um, the healthy rivers and the and the efficiency of the hydro. It's certainly not something that I I was aware of in that detail. So thank you very much for sharing that. I think it's very encouraging that we have these as demonstration sites and test sites, and, and particularly the the stickle gill example where the some at least some of the uh, energy generated is, is used on site yeah thanks very much for joining us john and um, we're going to move on now to to sheila um, sheila uh, tell us about the uh, clean uh, river kent campaign so over to you sheila thanks thanks very much i'm hoping that nigel's going to put my slides up i should have checked beforehand is that okay nigel oh well, I'll start without the slides. They're not actually. Uh, Sheila, yes, I, I will do that. So if you just give me one moment, please. Okay, I'll, I'll start, like start talking. talking, talking to, you, yeah. Yeah, so it's not to waste time. Well, um, thanks very much. We're a campaign that's based on the River Kent, also Triple SI and SAC, um, and not in the greatest state at the moment. We're a coalition of communities running from Staveley down to Sedgwick. It's about eight miles of river. And we came together in the autumn of 2021, partly, um, I think, uh, just at the beginning of the growing national awareness of the terrible state of rivers and coastal waters and lakes. But also there was a fish kill in the Kent in July 21. And we are still awaiting the outcome of the investigation into that, but it was very significant. So we, if I could move on to the third slide, thanks. Uh, our objective is primarily to reduce the amount of effluent discharged into the River Kent from a variety of sources, but initially we're focusing on the sewage wastewater treatment works. Um, and also to make sure then that we've got the investment that we need um, and that we're protecting the ecology and wildlife of the river, as well as making it safer for uh, leisure-based water, sorry, water-based leisure pursuits. So if I could just go on to the next but one slide. Um, this is a review of our first year, 2022. 
we initially realized that it was going to be absolutely crucial to have the community with us. And so we put a lot of early effort into communications, the usual things, a Facebook page, a newsletter, weekly updates. We did an open day in the spring and then a wrap up day in the autumn and a volunteer training day in May. We produced a short film plus a crowdfunder film, a film declaring the rights of the River Kent. And starting from scratch, we raised £7,500 from a variety of funders. So we were aiming to secure community engagement, if I could have the next slide. And um, we also initiated discussions with United Utilities, minimal tangible progress so far, but we have built a, a conversation and we're keen to continue to push for accountability to the community. And then we've also established links with Universities Cumbria and now also with Lancaster engage with local residents. It was crucial to show that we had local support, other river users, and work with our stakeholders. And through various means, we generated local media interest, not so much national yet, but we're ambitious for that too. Um, the next slide, we put a big emphasis on recruiting volunteers, but also on supporting them. So I think sometimes it's really difficult if you're a volunteer, you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing, not terribly confident about it. So we really tried through training, through one-to-ones, to working with volunteers. Nobody went out on their own until they were happy to do that. And we also had a range of things that people could do. So um, lots of people did uh, surveys, river diaries, user counts. We had people who helped with stats, had people who were willing to give talks, lots of photographs, helping with fundraising, creating artwork. Had a couple of Duke of Edinburgh award students who were both successful. And then we also did river water sampling, which um, I'll just go on to show you the results of. So if we could just go forward two slides. Um, that's just a bit of information about it. And this is uh, what we did. We talked with the Ilkley Clean River Group, who were the first group in England to get bathing status, and that was for the River Wharf. They said that a key part of their campaign was to test the river water for faecal bacteria. So we did an initial pilot monitoring study and then collected water samples through the summer. And on the next two slides, I'll just show you the results. If you look first of all at the black dotted line, that is the upper limit for uh, the Environment Agency to determine that the water is of adequate quality. It's not good quality, but it's adequate. And you can see that for E. coli, that's um, a, a fecal bacteria, at each of our six sites, sorry for the small writing, but these were six places where we knew that the river was used on a regular basis. The levels of E. coli were above the acceptable level. And the next slide shows slightly different pattern, but the same sorts of results for Enterococcus and other fecal bacteria. So we've demonstrated um, on a small number of samples, we sampled over 16 days in total, that our river water quality is poor in terms of bacterial monitoring. Now, this is a small sample. We would be the first to say that, but no one else has done this. So we think this, these are important data from a citizen science project and uh, it needs further investigation and action. The next slide, um, the parish council have been concerned about the quality of water and problems with the wastewater treatment works at Staveley for some time. And they, in parallel with what we were doing, took observations starting in February, and they actually continuing until this February, but we just collected the data up to December. The dump pipe, that's untreated sewage, was discharging on 54% of the days when they took observations, 74 out of 138 days, most frequently when the weather was wet. 
and every day during October and November when an observation was taken. That was over 50% of the days in October and November. And that was confirmed, the problems at the waterworks, uh, by a student dissertation from the University of Cumbria, which showed pollution much higher below than above the wastewater treatment works. So we know we've got a problem with that. Um, if I could just go on to the next slide. So that was our first year. Now, just talking quickly about 2023, um, we, in 2022, we had the citizen science volunteer-led projects collecting data on river use, which contributed to our DEFRA application for bathing status. And then we had the river water sampling. Um, our volunteers are very keen to continue with citizen science. So we're thinking about a genetic testing project this year, which will enable us to determine the sources of pollution, human or to what extent other animals, and also to work with Freshwater Watch and continue working with South Cumbria Rivers Trust and the FBA and strengthening our links with the Universities of Cumbria and Lancaster because as, as citizen science, we need expertise, we need scientific advice, and we certainly need help with the data analysis and interpretation. And then we're going to have two other strands of work. Um, next slide. We want to become more visible and effective locally, holding United Utilities to account, and also the Environment Agency as the environmental regulator and we want to work more effectively with media partners to create and publicize local campaigns. And the next slide um, is to develop stronger networks of local organizations within Cumbria and also to become more effective on the national platform. Groups are working much more effectively together now at a national level, but also in Cumbria, we're aware of a growing number of projects like ours. We want to work with them and if we can support them so that they don't make some of the mistakes that, that we've made. Um, but we think it's important as well to position the River Kent group as a national leading edge group. If I could just have the final slide, um, that one, that's one, thanks. This is just a summary of what we're planning for 2023 and the budget that we're looking for. So we're actively fundraising. We're talking more explicitly this year about um, funding support for uh, volunteer support. So we kind of did it a bit on the, on the wing last year, but I think building in volunteer support from the beginning is really important. And the funds we've received so far, we've actually received another thousand since I did this slide a week ago. So we're aiming for 10,000. And I guess I would say that we're on our way so thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think, again, it's a, it's a very positive story, um, albeit with some um, slightly alarming water quality um, data thrown in there. But it, it got me thinking about um, maybe how um, others on the call, uh, the Zero Carbon uh, Cumbria Partnership might be able to help with some of that um, advice, data analysis, expertise, et cetera, and uh, particularly building um, further awareness and connecting you into, into other networks working in Cumbria, but possibly um, possibly beyond as well and, and looking at best practice elsewhere. So it'd be good to pick that up with you um, after the call. Um, and thank you all, um, all the presenters, and particularly uh, both what you've presented, a very rich amount of information and some very strong images and, and messages in there, but also Thank you for keeping to time. Um, but for today, um, thank you again, for everyone, for joining us. But particular thanks as well to the great um, presentations and, and speakers. That's uh, It's been a great session. Really enjoyed that. Thank you.